Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. And welcome back to Episode 3 of Honey Money. On today's episode, we're going to explore the lifestyles of the humble bumble bee. Now, Nicole, I've heard it said that the leader of a bee hive is known as the queen. And much like many royalty may attest to, the queen bee has a wide variety of homes, mansions, manors, and hives. Can you please begin to explain, for our dear listeners, the variety of options a queen bee and her keeper may have? Well, first of all, I feel the need to apologize (laughs) to the listeners. (laughs) And second of all, we're talking about honeybees, not bumblebees. I'm not going to do that voice anymore. I'm sorry. (laughs) I was just, I was on a riff. I had to go. All right. <laughs> tell, all right. <clears throat> Please tell me, tell the listeners, what, what kind of, what kind of, when you got a honeybee, what kind of boxes can you put them in? What do you got? Hive styles. The most common and the one that we see pretty universally is the Langstroth hive. And that's your, you know, the typical square box that you stack up and they come in two different options. You can either have an eight frame or a 10 frame. And that's pretty much what everybody uses. It's kind of been around forever and it's just kind of the... The bee's knees. It is, in fact, the bee's knees. So the eight or, or 10 frame options and then there's some variations and we can talk more about um, the different things with the Langstroth and how to get it set up and stuff. That's an entirely another episode in and of itself. So we have Langstroth Mm -hmm. and I know we're going to do a deep dive on another episode because that is just the most interesting thing I can think of. But I guess what I want to do is I kind of want to like go over all of them and then recap the pros and the cons before we really dive in. Let's go like, give me like a quick, what are the names? What are we talking about? Okay. So so Langstroth is the one we already talked about. Top Bar, Ware, and an AZ or a Slovenian. And then there's several other different little kind of niche ones or whatever. There's the Eco Box and there's the Cathedral Hive, but those are all kind of more smaller scale. The the ones that we listed are what most people would at least kind of start out with in their first year or three. Okay. And so again, because this is geared towards the amateur keeper, what would you recommend for somebody just starting off? What's what's cost effective? What's easy? I mean, what are the pros and cons? What do you think? So the Langstroth hive is going to be probably your best route. It's the most easily accessible. It's kind of, I would say, a tie with the top bar as far as simplicity to make it home. I'd say it's probably also kind of a tie between the Lang and the top bar as far as the initial cost. But the thing with the Langstroth is you can get a lot more accessories and things for them. They're they're kind of universal. So if you buy Lang parts from Man Lake, you can also buy Langstroth parts from Dadent and they should work together just fine as long as you make sure that you get eight frame equipment if you have an eight frame hive and a 10 frame equipment if you get a 10 frame hive. And you said that the costs are comparable. What what are we looking at for a Langstroth or a top bar? So a Langstroth, most of the time they'll sell like a starter kit where you would start out with uh, obviously your bottom board, a deep box, and usually a medium box, and then your inner cover and a lid. And prices vary um, depending on if you want it assembled, painted, whether or not you have to have it shipped or if you could buy it locally. But I would say from $150 to $200-ish. The last and only, I guess, top bar that I've ever purchased, I paid $250 for it. But the thing with the Langstroth starter kit, those two boxes, you're going to need to expand upon that. But with the top bar, that $250 got everything that I needed. So the top bar might cost a little bit more as a package, but it's going to last you longer. It's going to get you further. It'll last longer just uh, in that you don't need to add anything to it. But top bar beekeeping, some people say it's a little bit more challenging. I know I've experienced some challenges with it, but that's mostly because I can't get bees to stay in it long enough to <laughs> really get it going. But okay. What about these other, you said there's the Ware and the Sylvanian, I think. Why would I ever buy one of those if you just gave this glowing recommendation for the top? So the top bar and the Langs are really especially common in the U.S. The top bar is also sometimes called the Kenyan top bar. You could potentially, if you got really creative, make your own. So people that are budget conscious, I mean, really, um, you could make a top bar out of kind of some scrap material and catch a swarm of bees and effectively get started into beekeeping for like zero cost. Whereas with the Langstroth and you have to buy a specific material that go, you know, the frames have to be a certain size. So there's more expense there. But the Ware and the Slovenian, those are especially more common outside of the U.S. Why? Just cultural preference? Yeah. Is it a, a geographical thing? 
so if you've ever seen online, like there's the pictures of the of a flatbed trailer with brightly painted hives on it. Um, those would be your Slovenians. Um, or you can use the Slovenian hives um, and they'll they'll make like a barn, like a shed. And the advantage of that is the beehives are tightly packed together. So in the high alpine areas, they are better at conserving heat so that it's a little bit more... I guess it's a little easier, you know, a hive out in the middle of the field by itself in the high alpine would have a harder time with thermal regulation than if you stacked them all together. So if our listeners are in America, but they're in a slightly colder climate, might they consider a different hive or is it's not, not enough? I would still stick with the Lang. Um, my personal opinion is your Langstroth or your top bar is the beginner recommendation. And then after you've been doing it for a while and you want to try some different things, then you could branch out into the Ware or the Slovenian. I don't have either one of those yet, but that's that's my next step is I want to try them, if nothing else, just to try them. One hive that I forgot to mention earlier that we should talk about is called the Flow Hive. And the Flow Hive is basically a Langstroth hive that has a special box, the Honey Super, and you can harvest honey by the turn of a dial. So basically you turn the dial and it has these special frames in it. So they open a gate and honey pours out. So you have a tap yeah. for honey. It, it's yeah, honey on tap. I think that's actually even what they call it. There's a lot of people that hate them and then there's people that love them. Why would anybody hate them? It seems convenient and easy. Let me Let me preface this by saying I've never used one. So I cannot speak from experience. I can only talk about things I've read on the internet, which is always true. Um, always. Always. Wikipedia is the best source. Yes. <laughs> so there's some people that don't like it because it has a lot of plastic components. It's not the best for the bees and that it's full of plastic and, and material like that. And then it also encourages beekeepers not to be beekeepers. So instead of having to open the hive and see how they're doing and to you know see how their honey production is, there's people that say, well, if you can just put out the box, have the bees in there and then go pour honey out when you want, like you're not being an actively engaging beekeeper. So the elitist beekeepers say that's easy mode and it doesn't count. Is that oversimplifying things? Would you say that flow hives are just kind of easy mode? They are, but I would recommend that people at least, you know, kind of look into them a little bit more instead of going that route because easy doesn't necessarily mean the best. Okay. Let's really focus in. You said that you recommend the Langstroth or the top bar. If if I'm listening to this, I want to blow by blow, step by step, what do I have to do to set this thing up? Start us away. What do we need to talk about here? So you can really take a lot of different avenues on the Langstroth hive. Um, there's a lot of different components and a lot of different ways to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Now, keep in mind that you just need to find what works for you. And if you go online and if you ask questions, you're going to get a whole bunch of different answers. And I would say, try something, see if you like it. And if you don't, switch it up because there's a lot of different variations on things. So the basic like beginner kit, like I said, comes with the bottom board, a deep box, a medium box, uh, inner cover, and a lid. And that's just the basic basic. As your colony grows, you're going to need to add additional boxes for brood and or honey. So we should probably start, I guess, with whether or not you want to buy an eight frame or a 10 frame starter kit. So the difference is obviously the the just the um, number of frames inside. There's no difference in like a deep 10 frame box and a deep 8 frame box are still the same depth. And I'm going to be really dumb here. What exactly is a frame? So a frame is the divider kind of thing that goes inside of the box where the bees build their comb. And you said an 8 and a 10 are exactly the same depth. So what's the difference between an 8 and a 10 besides the number of frames? I mean, what does that mean to me? Why would I want a 10 versus an 8? So some people say that they don't want to get a 10 frame because the bees don't really use the two outer boxes. They only use the eight frame, or I'm sorry, the two outer frames. They only use the eight frames to begin with. The eight frame is lighter than a 10 frame. But one way that you can overcome that, if weight is an issue, instead of buying an eight frame, you can still buy a 10 frame. And then if you have to move uh, the box and you just take 
the frames out individually. So then instead of moving 60 pounds, you're only moving 10 pounds at a time or whatever it may be. How much does each frame cost? Uh, excuse me, way. Well, depends on what's in it. <laughs> okay. I told you there are no simple answers. I, I'm sorry. I need to stop asking f for simple answers. Fine. What would you recommend? Would you recommend an eight or a 10 frame? Well, I'm not done talking about it. I'm please continue. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> So if weight is also an issue, there's other ways around it. I use 10 frames. I personally like 10 frame uh, boxes just because in my experience, the bees have utilized the entire area. You can also take things a step further and use a 10 frame box and put eight frames in it and then use a spacer. So if you get 10 frame, you decide you want to do eight frames, you can do that too. So get a 10 frame and then you can customize it to your heart's desire. Awesome. What else? Okay, so we've got the Langstroth. We got the 10 frame. What else do I need to know? So when you order them online, you'll either order them assembled or unassembled. I work a lot, so I always buy everything assembled. Um, for those that are more handy or have a little bit more time or just want to, you can buy them unassembled. They're not difficult to put together. I just genuinely don't have time for it. So you should buy hives that have finger joints instead of the rabbit joints because um, as wood warps over time, the finger joints will stay together better and they'll just last a little bit longer. And then most of the time, the Langstroth are made out of pine. You can find potentially cedar ones. Cedar ones will last longer, but it's pretty much just going to be uh, a pine. So pine doesn't do well just out in the elements, so you will need to paint them. Again, you can buy them pre-painted, pre-assembled, so you just add bees. If you do decide to paint them yourself, just a side note, do not paint the inside of the beehive, only the outside where uh, it would get exposed by weather. And is this paint like a sealant uh, like, uh, or, or is it like a cool color? Can I get like racing stripes on my beehive? Well, I mean, it's your beehive. You can paint it however you want. Yes. <laughs> going to have racing stripes. Yes. But you want to paint them a light color um, because, you know, they're out in the sun. You don't want to paint it a dark color where it's going to get super hot inside. So in addition to painting your beehive, you can use a product called Eco Wood Treatment. And it's usually available on most of the beekeeping websites. Um, I treated my top bar with that and it seems to be holding up pretty well. Um, it's not a paint... It's almost more like a stain, but I believe it has copper in it. So it just kind of prevents the wood from degrading out in the sun, but it's totally free of chemicals. So, you know, it's good to keep chemicals away from your bees as much as possible. But in theory, you can buy, if you buy it pre-assembled, it already has some sort of paint on it. You don't need to worry about it. Well, the there's a difference between pre-assembled and pre-painted. You can buy a oh. pre-assembled -pre unpainted. So basically when you buy it. If you want it to be pre-painted, make sure it says pre-painted. Yes. Get, that makes sense. It's pretty basic. Okay. So we got our, our, we got, we got our hive. We got the right wood. We got the right finger joints. We got the right eight or the 10. We got the paint. What else is there? Oh, but wait, there's more. Oh gosh, there always is. <laughs> Here we go. So bottom boards, um, there are solid bottom boards and screened bottom boards and so with everything, there's lots of debate on whether or not you should use certain ones and when you should use them. I use a screen bottom board. For me, this is part of my integrated pest management program. So there's a screen on the bottom. So if the bees were to pull a mite off of a, a sister or whatever and drop the mite, then the mite falls through the screen onto the ground and goes away. Um, you can also use, actually put the board back in and close it off if you need to or put um, the board with some sticky paper and use that for kind of an estimate on mite counts but I also like it because it gets so darn hot here um, you know we've had temperatures in the 120s but it's usually over 100 degrees in the summer so the screen bottom board helps with some ventilation and I leave my screen bottom boards open in the winter to help um, reduce condensation uh, inside of the hive. Um, but then I don't use a landing board. The, the little lip on the screen bottom board is is plenty. To me, uh, the bottom boards are just a little bit more for aesthetics. Okay. And that's the bottom board discussion. We've, put, we've laid it to rest. Yes. You heard it here first, folks. Get the screen, winter or summer. What else we got? Um, so working up through the hive, we could talk about whether or not to use foundation. Inside of your frames. And I think my wife puts it on her face. 
That is one kind of foundation. What yes. kind of foundation are we talking about? <laughs> so foundation in this case literally being the base in which they build off of. Okay. Like foundation of a house. So I personally use foundation lists. No foundation. I just put empty frames and a little guide on the top and let the bees do their thing. Um, I like to try to keep bees with as little chemicals and human intervention as possible. So I just let them build build the way that they want to build. And that allows me to create like honeycomb and stuff without any manufactured wax in the middle. And also it lets the bees create their own cell sizes, whether or not um, they want to make brood comb out of it or whatever. They, they can make pick whatever size they want to make. Um, you can also, if you choose to use foundation, there's waxed foundation, which is a pressed wax with obviously the honeycomb pattern and it's got wires in it. There's plastic foundation. There's waxed plastic foundation, which is just plastic foundation with a layer of wax on it. <laughs> wow. There, there is uh, just plain plastic. I don't know if I said that one yet. That is just plastic with no foundation. Then uh, you can get different colors of plastic, uh, black plastic, so that it's easier to see the eggs or just a regular like white plastic. Uh, in my experience, the bees don't like the plastic. They won't build on it. So if you're going to use foundation, I would suggest from my own personal experience to use a wax foundation, not waxed plastic. But you can get away with no foundation at all? Yes. And that's how you prefer it? That's how I do it for my own personal beekeeping practices. Okay. All right. And moving right on up from the foundation, what do we have next? Um, queen excluders. I don't use, uh, well, maybe I should say what a queen excluder is. Um, so a queen excluder is a metal screen, for lack of better terms, that goes between your brood box and your honey super, so where the bees put their eggs and where you want the bees to put the honey, to keep the queen from going into the honey super and potentially laying eggs where there should be honey. I don't use one. And just because I've never had experience with the queen going into the honey supers and, and putting any eggs up there, I always leave two boxes, two deeps for uh, brood chambers. And that's apparently been, you know, enough to make them happy because I've never had them go up. Um, but then that kind of goes back to the whole, I kind of want the bees to be bees. So if they decided to go up there, then then so be it. So I don't use those. Um, there's also the potential that it might not even work if you have a smaller queen and she could still wiggle her way up to the honey super. So is it, It's not, the impression I'm getting from you here, is it safe to say that you take more of a minimalist approach to your beehives? I do. I consider myself, instead of a beekeeper, more of an apartment manager. <laughs> um, you know, there's some things that I do get pretty involved in as far as splits and I, I want to kind of dabble in making queens and stuff. Um, but after, after the bees are queen, queen right in their colony, for the most part, I just kind of want them to be bees and do their thing. you just, you take a hands-off approach at that point. For the most part. And would you recommend that the listeners follow suit i mean it sounds like a personal preference thing they may do it their own way but at least for the very beginner is that an easier way to do things the problem with the beginners is they're so excited to get the new hive that they're going to want to be really hands-on and they're going to want to be digging around in there a lot um and the more the more that you see and the more that you experience the more you're going to learn um i'm not saying by any means that i'm an expert um some of it is a combination of I work like a gazillion jobs and I don't always have time to micromanage them as much as I might like. But outside of of population management, I'll say with, you know, preventing swarms by by doing splits and things like that. Um, I like the idea of having happy bees, basically bee centric beekeeping. So I want the bees to just be, be bees without micromanaging them. And, um, <laughs> it's okay. You can laugh publicly. <laughs> <laughs> BBs. That's great. That's <laughs> Basically, I just, I want the best honey possible. And I feel like one of the greatest ways to do that is just to let the bees do what the bees would do naturally. Okay. And you talked 
in your spiel just a moment ago, you talked a little bit about some maintenance you can do. Splitting the splitting the hive, I think you said, or splitting the bees swarm. Um, we're going to talk more about maintenance in a different episode, right? Yeah. Once you get it all set up, what you what you have to do on the day to day, the week to week. So we'll get we'll get to that. I don't. I want the listeners to know we're not just glossing over it. Yeah. So maybe let's get back to the hive itself. We went over. Uh, we just covered foundation, or was there something else we covered? Um. So yeah, we got we got foundation and queen excluders. Right. Queen excluders. What comes after queen excluders? So in my mental approach of moving up through the hive here, um, let's go back to the bottom because I forgot this one. Entrance reducers. Um, when you very first install your bees, you should put an entrance reducer on there. Um, so basically if you're again, using a Langstroth hive, the entire width of the bottom of the hive is, is access for them to, to come in and out. Well, when they're first getting established, um, especially if you're starting out with a swarm or something that's a smaller population. I like to use the entrance reducer on the smallest setting, especially, especially if, if you um, did a split or installed a new queen because you don't want robbers coming in and killing um, your colony. And if it's small, then it's not going to be able to defend itself well. So if you put an entrance reducer on, so they only have it's the smaller, um, Entrance is two B widths. That sounds very small. It is, okay. but it's also easier to defend. So um, you're you're not quite, but you're almost locking the bees in there while they get established. Uh, more like putting up a fence for them to keep. Okay, great. So, is there a point down the road that you expand that opening? Then what what do you look for before you do that? Um, and we can maybe talk about that more under maintenance episode. Yeah. Okay. But as their population grows and they'd be able to defend that larger area, then you can open them up. Okay. So we went back to the beginning. We have this B entrance excluder. Let's go back to the queen excluder. What, what, what happens after that? Um, so one of the other things would be a feeder, which is a whole episode in and of itself, but I will just say that if you're installing a new package or a new swarm, or even a nuke, because you're moving them to a new area. You should feed them for, let's just say a week or so, something to kind of help them get started until they're able to find the lay of the land and find resources. But please do not use a Boardman entrance feeder. And we'll talk more about feeders later, but but just for right now, Boardman feeders, um, they're they use a mason jar and kind of this little platform that just slips into the entrance so you can access the mason jar from the outside and see how much is in there. But I can almost guarantee you that you're going to cause robbing and the loss of your colony with the Boardman entrance feeder. Boardman entrance feeder. Don't do it. Got Don't it. do it. You heard it here first. All right. Feeders. We covered feeders? As much as we will now, yes. Okay. All For right. now. Writing down. I, we have lots I see of that. episodes coming up. <laughs> this is, okay. What have I gotten myself into? All right. What comes after feeders? Um, so from there, I would say most of the time it would just be your um, inner cover and your telescoping lid that goes on top here because it gets too hot. And if it gets into the, I would say, mid to high 90s or higher in your area, I would recommend a upper ventilation screen. You can buy pre-made ones or you can make one. There's a bunch of different options, but if you have your screen bottom board on the bottom that's open with ventilation and your screened upper inner cover, um, then it kind of just creates a better ventilation and helps the bees cool down, especially at night um, and, and decrease bearding and stuff. Um, and then from there, um, the telescoping covers what pretty much everybody uses. You could use a migratory cover, um, but telescoping is what uh, just backyard beekeepers use. The uh, tel uh, the um, migratory covers for commercial beekeepers. You can use it. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not directed towards backyard beekeepers. And then after that, just make sure that you put um, something on top of your entrance. Or um, gosh. Make sure you put something on top of your inner cover... <laughs> Damn it. Make sure, make sure you put something on top of your telescoping lid. Um, things like wind and, and critters and stuff can knock that lid off. So you need, I just use a, uh, just like a cinder block thing, or you could use a paint can filled with sand or, you know, just whatever, even a strap if you needed to, to keep it from 
from falling off or getting blown off or whatever. You have nothing else. At least you can say, even if you don't want to use a solid bottom board or whatever, at least you know kind of what it is. And just keep in mind that um, as you go through the catalogs and talk to people online, there's just about an infinite number of options um, as far as hive configurations. Just start with something. Don't get overwhelmed with all of the options and, oh my gosh, I don't know if I need this or if I need this or what I'm supposed to do. Because keep in mind, there's a million different variables, which means that the bees are really adaptable. So they'll make do with whatever you give them. You're not going to mess up. You're not going to give them something that they can't work with. Some things just make your life a little bit easier. The bees really don't care too much within reason, you know, what you give them. Some of it's going to make it easier for you. Some of it's going to make it more comfortable for the bees or whatever. But if if bees weren't able to adapt to so many different options, there wouldn't be so many options. So just don't get overwhelmed with, with all the choices. Get something and just get started and you can always change it later. But um, you don't know what you like or what works best for you until you get started. You can only take so much from other people and and um, you just need to find your your groove. Great. Well, all right then. As always, we have our contact information at the bottom. I'm Drake Larson, and this is Nicole. And if you guys have any other questions in addition to our contact information, you can always check out our Facebook group that we just started, Friends of Heritage Acres Market on Facebook, and um, start some discussion on there and ask questions about hives or anything else that you've heard on our show. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty a podcast by heritageacresmarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.